Hi, AP Psychology students, and welcome back. Today we are moving away from physical development into our topic of cognitive development, and we're going to be focusing on some specific theories that have been uh, created to explain how our uh, ability to reason and process and think changes over time. This aligns with College Board Topic 3.4, uh, Cognitive Development Across the Lifespan, and goes with the learning objective, explain how theories of cognitive development apply to behavior and mental processes. Some essential questions we're going to be looking at today are how did Piaget broaden our understanding of how the mind develops? How did Vygotsky's ideas of cognitive development differ from Piaget's? And how has current research built on both of these understandings? So the first person we're going to talk about is Piaget, right? Um, when we think about cognitive development, the question we're really asking is how do humans' cognitive abilities, so reasoning, thinking, remembering, communicating, grow over time? And Piaget, Jean Piaget, um, a French um, psychologist had pioneered research into this topic and it wasn't that he originally set out to do this he was actually creating um, questions for intelligence tests for IQ testing for children in France and he realized that all the children kept making the same mistakes um, in the same age range and so he started being curious if those mistakes mean something about the way that they understand and view and you know their perspective on the world. And so what he decided to do is uh, focus on the similarities and the mistakes they were making and kind of test them to see if he could develop a theory. And through this testing, he developed a theory of stages. So there's four st distinct stages that he thought that kids went through. And as you move from one stage to the next, there were major uh, changes in the way that you kind of understood the world and the way that your reasoning and thinking ability grew. This theory is flawed, but extremely influential, right? Uh, we talk about it today in terms of understanding childhood development, understanding education, understanding parenthood. Um, you know, so many different things help help or use Piaget's theory to help us understand um, the differences in thinking. But his theory was flawed in that, you know, it was very kind of stage focused. And it's like this happens and then this happens. And what we've learned over time is that that's just not really true, that um, a lot of times it's more continuous and slower growing, that you might move uh, forward in one ability a, a little bit sooner than in another, um, and that it's not like a distinct switch um, when you ever when you move from one stage to the next, and it's not really these distinct ages. It's not like at six, you're one way, and then at seven, you're another, right? That this changes happen four and a half, five, six, seven, little by little by little. Okay, so when Piaget was trying to explain cognitive development, one of the things that he developed is this idea of a schema, right? So it's this concept that as children grow and learn about their world, they try to organize the information and that organization takes the, takes the form of schemas. Schemas are just like a conceptual framework that you use to understand things. So for example, like let's talk about a, a schema of a restaurant, right? So, okay, restaurants, if I say the word restaurant, you have an understanding of what that is. You know what to expect, you know what it might look like, you know what you might experience there, right? Though that is your schema of a restaurant, okay? And that doesn't mean that all restaurants look the same, but you have certain expectations, like it's where you get food, you're going to have to order the food, somebody's going to give you the food or you're going to pick it up, right? There's like a set of, you know, kind of guidelines. Schemas can um, exist for everything. So they exist for yourself, that you have an understanding of yourself. They exist for different situations like a restaurant or a doctor's office or a airport. They exist um, for ways that um, like uh, situations happen to so like a date, you know, even, or like a friendship is a schema. Um, so schemas are everything. And as we get older, we have them for hundreds of things. But when you're young, you're developing them one at a time. So how do these develop? How do they grow? How do they change um, as, you're, as you get older? So they go through two processes. So the first is assimilation. And this is when we add new information or experiences into something existing. So let's take the restaurant example again. So you've got this understanding of a restaurant and every restaurant that you've ever been to with your family, you sit at a table and the waiter comes up to you and asks you what you want and then brings you the food. So one day you go to a restaurant and at this restaurant you order at the counter instead of the waiter coming to you and then you have to go get the food and you're like well this isn't a restaurant because at a restaurant there's a waiter and your mom or dad or whoever's with you is like no like sometimes restaurants you have to go get the food this is kind of called like a fast casual restaurant or a fast food restaurant etc and now you have assimilated this new information accommodation is where you would change your schema so you you know i have this original schema where you have okay you sit at a table a waiter comes over takes your order brings you food so let's say you walk into like a building like a library right and there's a bunch of tables with chairs around it and people sitting and you think oh this must be a restaurant 
And then your parents are like, no, this is not a restaurant, it's a library. Like, yes, there are tables and chairs and everybody is sitting and people are being helped, but they're not serving food. Uh, you know, the idea here is that you read books or study, so this is not a restaurant. So now you are accommodating and saying that not every place with tables and chairs uh, that people sit together is a restaurant, right? So that would be accommodation. Um, this visual is kind of another example of this. Uh, it talks about uh, dogs and like a kid believing that a cat was a dog until they realized that not all things with four legs and fur are dogs, that you can also be a cat. So his theory um, has four stages, like I mentioned before, uh, sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. So you'll see that three out of the four stages mention this idea of operational. Um, and this is really just what he described as like mental operations as kind of like the ability to solve, kind of think uh, of um, answers in your mind, right? So to be able to take that concept and you can either be pre-operational, so you can't do it quite yet, concrete operational, you need uh, like physical things in front of you to, be able to do the thinking and then formal operational when you have that higher level thinking. Like I said, PJ attached specific ages to these, but we don't really do that necessarily anymore, but we do kind of think they still follow the same sequence, even though it might not be attached to specific ages. So the first stage is sensory motor stage, and it's exactly what it sounds like. In, the wor in, the, in their understanding of the world, as they grow, they're using their senses. Everything goes in their mouth, right? They want to touch everything. They got to grab everything. They put it in their mouth. They smell it, whatever. And they're developing their motor skills, right? They are learning to move their arms, their leg, roll, sit, stand, all, do all of these like, really important motor skills. So some cognitive skills that are being developed um, during this time are, one of them is a big one called object permanence. So this is the idea that when, when you're little and something is removed from you, right? Like you actually think it's gone. Like you don't know that if somebody takes a, a toy away from you that it still exists. You think that when something's gone, it's gone. Object permanence is your awareness that like when something is gone, it's still there. This is literally when the point when like a toddler tries to grab things or not even a toddler, like an infant tries to grab something and the parent doesn't want them to touch it, like the remote control because kids are obsessed with remotes. So the kid grabs the remote and at a certain age, the parent can just take the remote and hide it and the kid will be distracted and move on. However, once they have object permanence, you take the remote, like they're glowing looking for the remote. Like they're not giving up. They know you took the remote. They know it's still there. They're going to look for it, right? Um, and another interesting kind of skill that goes along with object permanence is a stranger anxiety. And this is the idea that strangers, um, like all of a sudden at one point in your development, usually between like eight and 10 months, you start to realize that like stranger, like who a stranger is, that you like don't know somebody, like the difference between who you know and don't know. And that fact that like if your mom or dad leaves you with a stranger, like you're like, where's mom and dad? Like I want them to come back. Um, and that's kind of linked to this awareness that things exist even when you can't see them. Here's a picture of a kid who does not have object permanence because they're playing with this cute little teddy bear and then they put a wall in front of it and they don't try to look for it. They just kind of get distracted and move on to something else. Okay, so the next stage of development is this pre-operational stage. Remember the operational is the kind of that mental thinking. So they're pre-operational, whereas they're starting to develop some of these skills. So a lot of what this, a lot of what develops in this um, phase is language, right? That they are using words and images. They're really focused on pretend play, uh, but they can't really do things in their head. Uh, they can't like imagine, uh, you know, how things could turn out or kind of see things happening in the future. Um, it's very much whatever's in front of them. This ends up looking pretty illogical. Like you think of like toddlers, they like say and do kind of crazy, silly things because they just see things for what they are. Um, they, uh, toddlers are very well known for having animism. So this is the idea of like inanimate objects are alive or they have lifelike feelings, right? If they drop their teddy bear, their teddy bear is sad because they dropped it, right? Um, egocentrism. So toddlers tend to be uh, what looks like kind of self-centered, but actually what it is is that they do not understand that you and me have different perspectives than them. So they think that whatever they see is whatever you see or whatever they think is whatever you think. And they do not understand at this point in their development that you think differently than them. Now, they can they start to develop this, right? Like my four-year-old can understand that if he hits somebody that hurts them, like understands that their point of view, but it's not perfect yet and he's not great at it all the time and still doesn't ha doesn't understand why he has to share sometimes, right? But they're working on that skill. As they continue to grow, they will develop the ability to understand that people have different minds than them and that's called the theory of the mind when it develops usually a little bit later, kind of fully around seven or eight. 
Um, as you can see here, this is just two examples of like kids doing that pretend play. So using a teddy bear to stand in for a baby or using a, um, a like blanket to stand for a cape, right? Pretending um, that, you know, a, a heart maybe is a wand or some other, th you know, tool. Um, pretend play is a big part of how they learn at this stage. Now, one of the things that uh, PHA really focused on in this stage is like the skills that toddlers lack. So two very specific skills that they lack are conservation and reversibility. So let's just talk about conservation for a second. So conservation is the fact that they don't understand that a physical property of an item, like the mass or the size, stays the same despite changes in the form. Um, and the very famous example of this is a liquids experiment where they have two cups that are filled with the exact same and then they take one cup and they pour it in a tall skinny one and the kid says the tall skinny one has more right and that's what you see in this picture here because they don't like they're like and you're like why does it have more and they're like well it's bigger it has more so they don't understand that like this the amount actually stays the same it's the container that change they also have a hard time considering relationships in both directions or because they have a hard time with those mental operations. So they understand that they have a mom or that somebody else is a mom, but the fact that their mom has a mom or that their grandma or Nana is also a mom can be very difficult for them to understand, right? Okay, concrete operational stage. This is when they start to develop more ability to think about things logically, but the events have to be generally in front of them, right? So they're really capable of conservation and reversibility. They understand that like they are a son, right? Or but they, are, they have a brother, but their brother is also a brother, or they can start to do basic math, like two plus two is four, but four minus two is two, right? And they really understand that like, just because you pour it in a skinny container, it's still the same amount of liquid. So they're starting those logical abilities. And they are developing that theory of mind, like I talked about, where they start to understand others' perspectives and like feel like a sense of like, I should share, I should whatever, because like this, how, this is how I would feel, this is how I make that, that kind of thing. The skill that they're still working on is that abstract reasoning. So really that moral reasoning of like what is right and wrong, fair and just, right? They're still kind of developing those skills and that hypothetical thinking, if I do this, then do this, or what will happen in the future, um, you know, kind of cause and effect, working on it, but not fully developed yet. Um, they're really good at this stage of like playing games because they're much better at like following rules and taking turns and understanding that like if the card tells them they have to go back five, that like they need to do that thing. So they're better at this than a pre-operational child would be. The last stage is form operational, and this stage is all about that abstract reasoning, right? And this is from ages 12 up. So it's not to say that at 12 you are as sophisticated of a thinker as you are um, at 20, but that this abstract reasoning starts to develop at this time. Um, and the skills really that you're working on in this situation are just like, okay, continuing to developing higher order reasoning, right? That, you know, algebra or physics or um, even like English, right? It c continues to get harder and harder, more complexity, more things to think about, more variables to consider as you continue to grow and you can consider more and more and more complex ideas. All right, so let's briefly talk about Vygotsky. So Vygotsky is another researcher. He's from Russia, um, not as popular in our culture. However, did have a lot of theories that are really used in education to understand childhood development. So he really focused on the growth of cognition or the mind through a social cultural influence. So while Piaget might have said that um, little kids are little scientists, right, or young scientists, Vygotsky would have called them more like young apprentices so that they need it's it's more like they're not doing it on their own they need someone to guide them like an apprentice would have and key to this guiding is interactions with another human and scaffolds so like steps along the way to help them get to where they need to be a scaffold is just a support as a child develops their thinking abilities if you think about a scaffold kind of like in a physical way it's almost like if when you're learning to ride a bike training wheels are a scaffold so you get to practice the skill with a little stability and then you take the training wheels off and the scaffold is gone the zone of proximal development was one of uh, Vygotsky's main ideas and this is the idea that as children grow and learn they have a they have what they can't do they have what they can do and then they have that zone of proximal development and that zone of proximal development is right here and it's what they can do with help and this is really what he thought the sweet spot was for moving kids to new skills is finding them what they can do with help practicing with them as the um you know interaction and with scaffolds and as the you know the adult and then helping them move towards independence all right, make sure you stop here and answer these essential questions or check your ability to understand these essential questions. That's all for now, AP Psychos, and remember, psychology is flipping awesome.